Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter number 4. Gospel according to Matthew, chapter number 4. And as you're turning to that, I just want to echo the announcement about foster care and encourage you um, to consider that, to prayerfully uh, seek the Lord's will on that. Some of you may not understand, but I want to clarify that going to the meeting the informational meeting on March 28th does not mean that you are signing up for foster care. You're, you're going because you want to take the next step forward uh, in that, or you're going because you want to learn more about it, but you're not going to be uh, obligated or signed up uh, if you do it. You're going to learn about it. I hope you'll, many of you will consider it and certainly pray for this ministry opportunity. Well, this morning, this is a sermon that deals with the theme of discipleship, and it's going to be stretched out over two Sundays. I'm going to cover some of this material this morning, and Lord willing, I want to come right back to this next Sunday uh, as we think about Jesus' own discipleship. Today, I, I just want to lay a foundation about discipleship, Jesus and discipleship. And I'm going to tell you straight up that I'm going to be asking you today to make a decision. That's going to look different for different ones of us. But I'm going to ask you this morning, in response to this passage of Scripture that I'm about to read, to make a decision. For some, that's going to be a decision for the first time to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's going to be a decision this day that you make that says, I want to turn from my self-governed, self-directed life, and I want to believe on Christ to become a Christian. For others, it's going to be a decision as a believer, a decision that you make as a Christian to go to the next step of Christian growth. Maybe you have been stuck for a long time. And I'm going to invite you today, I'm going to urge you to make a decision this morning to take another step in your spiritual journey as a Christian. And then for some, there, there may be a sin pattern, something that just has a death grip on your life. And today needs to be a day of decision to say, I'm going to turn my back on that sin that has gripped me, that has mastered me. And I'm going to turn to Jesus for his power and the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome that habitual, repeated pattern of sin in my life. Now, that's going to be between you and the Lord, but God is going to, I believe, put that on some of our hearts, that this is the day to draw a line in the sand and say this, this practice, this habit, this way of living is something that now I must step away from. I think others need to make decisions concerning vocational Christian service. It may be that as you think about your future or as you think about your past, whether you are entering your 20s, 30s, or you're in your 60s and looking uh, at your 70s and looking back over your life, I'm going to ask that today some may make a decision about serving the Lord vocationally. Again, don't conclude, well, that's for those young people that's got their whole lives in front of them. They're the ones that could or should think about this. Some who are in your retirement years or are very close to those retirement years need to ask God, how do you want me to follow you during these next chapters or the next chapter of my life? What would it look like in my 60s or 70s if I'm serving the Lord in some means of vocational ministry. That may mean going overseas with the International Mission Board and serving for, for a year's time or a, a shorter time than that, maybe six months. It may mean volunteering for a ministry here. It, it may mean preparation for some. It may mean seminary, but it's it's the call of God that he places on a life calling you to say he wants you to serve him in some way. So that's where I'm going this morning. I'll come back to that at the end of the sermon. 
How is the Lord saying to you, follow me? So I hope no one will disengage and say, well, he couldn't possibly be saying that to me because I believe there's something for all of us here. Let's just take a look at the text now. Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases, and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So from this text, I want to give you four big ideas about discipleship. Here's number one, it's in your notes. Discipleship involves both a summons and a response. Discipleship involves both a summons and a response. As we read this passage, as I read this to you, you may think, wow, that's, that's strange. These fishermen casting a net into the Sea of Galilee or on a boat working their trade a man named Jesus walks along and says, follow me, and they drop everything and they leave it all behind and follow Jesus. Well, this is Jesus, granted. He is God incarnate. He does have great power, the power of the universe. But this is not the very first time that these four had met Jesus. If we harmonize the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, and if we look in the Gospel according to John, we would see or we would come to know that there had been an earlier calling. If we were to put it all together, in John chapter 1, these four are with their rabbi or their leader or their master, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is pointing them to a coming Messiah. In fact, on one occasion, when they first followed Jesus, they heard him say, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And they began to follow him. In fact, they, they approached him and said, Where are you staying? And he said, Come and see. And so for about a year, or I'm sorry, about a year and a half later, we come to Matthew 18. But in that initial calling, they approached Jesus. Where are you staying? We want to know more about you. Come and see. And so they followed him. And we know from uh, the Gospel of John that they were with him. They were present at the wedding in Cana of Galilee when he turned water into wine. They went with him to that first Passover when Jesus saw the mockery being made of the temple and watched him overturn the tables of the money changers. They, at least John, had pretty firsthand observation of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. He recorded that in great detail. So they had been around. They had heard Jesus. They had seen what he could do. They had seen at least following Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman, a woman who was very broken. They had heard what had happened in her life. They had seen the whole town coming out to inquire of Jesus. So now, as I said, a year and a half later, 
they're back to fishing. I don't think they're in rebellion. I don't think this is because they turned away from Jesus. This was their trade. This is what they did. And they made a pretty good living at it. It was not uh, the easiest job for sure. It was by no means a simple job. But as far as common laborers, it was among the better paying jobs. And so they're plying their trade. And as we read in verse number 19, Jesus approaches and says, follow me. Follow me. I want you to think on those two words. I, I, I'm struck by those words. And then the words, I will make you fishers of men. And what is their response? Well, we see it in the adverb in verse 20 and also in verse 22 immediately. Follow me. There's no hesitation. There's no, let us consider this. They made a decision. A decision on the spot. A decision based upon the fact that they knew something already of him. They had had exposure to his teachings. They had seen his miracles. And this time, and this is not the final call. There will be a, another, an additional calling that will take them further in their journey. But when he calls out to them, follow me. When he summons them. We read that immediately they left their jobs. This, this role as fishermen, not the highest on the social scale, but they were paid, again, better than most laborers. In this stage, as they begin to follow him, they, they, they are told they're going to be made fishers of men. This may hearken back to the book of Jeremiah. If you want to jot down Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 16, where fishermen and hunters are described as those who will get the people of Israel, catch them, bring them in, because judgment awaits them. They're about to be judged. They're about to be put into exile because of their sin and rebellion. Here, fishers of men does not seem so much that you're going to catch men for judgment, but you're going to catch them. You're going to bring them out of one environment into another for salvation. You're, you're going to catch them for those purposes. You're going to go after them, not to round them up for punishment and exile, but to round them up, to bring them in, to catch them for their salvation. And so this summons, follow me, it, it involves both a path and a person. Follow. If, if someone says follow, you get behind them. You, you get in line with them. And Jesus is calling you and you and you and you and all of us to follow him. We don't follow philosophies. We don't follow personalities. We don't follow denominations. We are a part of a denomination, but ultimately, we are subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ. We follow Him. We are behind Him. And that's what He calls you to and me to individually. To follow. Not to lead Him. Not to follow our ideas. Not to follow our philosophies or our learning. But to follow Him. Follow, get behind. And then it implies not only the path but a person. We're following Jesus. That's who you follow. The Lord Jesus Christ. And so I have a question for you. Will you hear that summons this morning? It'd be a tragedy to hear a biblical story, an account of Jesus in the Gospels and say, yep, that's what happened. Jesus walked along the sandy shores and he saw out on the Sea of Galilee these fishermen, and he said, follow me. And immediately they left everything and followed him. And that's the story, and now let me move on with my life. No, Jesus is saying to you, young man, to you, senior adult lady, he's saying to you, long-term member, he's saying to you, preacher, he's saying to you, first-time guest, he's saying, follow me, follow after me. And so will you hear that summons? 
and will you respond to it? Again, I want to say more about this next Sunday. I'm going to press into this a bit more. But for now, that's point number one, that Jesus summons us. He calls us to follow him. Number two, this is in your notes. Discipleship begins by acknowledging you need Jesus as Savior. Discipleship is not about just learning and growing. I couldn't have been more thrilled when I heard one of the men in one of our discipleship groups say a few weeks ago, I feel like we've sat around too long patting each other on the back about what we're reading and what we're doing and what we're learning and that we need to be extending our arms and our reach to others. There is no discipleship unless there's a beginning in discipleship. Discipleship, again, is not just learning. It's not just my Christian growth. It's not just my Bible reading or my memorizing scripture or my learning new lessons. Discipleship is embracing a broken world. It is, it is extending the being the feet and the hands of Christ to bring people into the kingdom. So it begins by acknowledging you need Jesus as Savior. As a Christian, that's where your discipleship must start with someone. If, if your discipleship never leads you to want people to be saved, to want people to come to, to the knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Savior, something is defective about that discipleship. And if you're not a believer, if you're not yet a Christian, if you don't even know what discipleship really means, get this down. Hear this preacher say this, your greatest need is to receive Jesus as your Savior. To receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. Again, when these men first heard Jesus, when they first followed him, what did John the Baptist say? What was it that got a hold of their hearts? Behold, a Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the one that the writings that you've read has pointed to. This is the one you're to follow. He's the Lamb of God. He's the one that died or will die. He's the one that would be buried and rise again from the grave. And so they followed him. And in that very moment, as they begin to follow him, their lives begin to change. And when you follow Jesus, when you believe on him, repent of your sin and trust in him, he will save you in that moment. The Bible describes this as being born again. Born again. Transformation, a change. Let, let those words just say, hear them slowly. Born again. A spiritual rebirth. And when that happens, God starts changing you. I love what D.L. Moody said. This is maybe a bit much to write down, but here it is. When you are a child of God, you will love the things that God loves. And what you once hated, you will love. And what you once loved, you will hate. That's a lot of what it means to be born again. When you're a child of God, you love what God loves. You begin to love new things. And the things that you once loved, the things that entertained you, brought you pleasure and happiness and joy and satisfaction, you don't love those things anymore. They're, they become distasteful. And the things you once hated, the things, gospel preaching, Bible reading, the teaching of the Bible, Christian fellowship, prayer, believers gathering together, things you once hated or kind of stiff-armed, you will begin to love those things. Sunday will become the best day of the week. It's not, thank God, it's Friday. It's, thank God, it's Sunday. I get to gather with brothers and sisters. I get to fellowship with my church. So discipleship begins by acknowledging you need Jesus as Savior. So I want to give you four words here, four key words. For some of you, this is going to be an explanation of the gospel. It's going to be, maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time, connecting the dots of how to become a Christian. 
for many of you who you already are a Christian, you have trusted in Christ, these four words can be a mechanism or a, a tool in your toolbox, if you will, your gospel toolkit to talk about Jesus, to help someone come to faith. So here are the words, and you decide where you fit with this. Is this your, your bridge to come to Jesus, your bridge to be saved, or is this your bridge that you need to cross back over in disciple making to have a conversation with others? First word is God. He's the creator of all things. He's good, he's holy, he's just, he's loving. He is the almighty, all-powerful God of the universe to whom we will all give an account one day. The second word is man. From birth, man has been in rebellion against God. From birth, man has been alienated from God. From birth, man has gone his own way. He's tried to climb a, a ladder to get to God and always discovered that the ladder is broken or the ladder is leaning against a crumbling wall. Man is broken, alienated from God, subject to the wrath of God, hostile to God, needs God. The third word beyond God and man is Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the man who is fully man and fully God. 100% man, 100% God, died on a cross after having lived a sinless, perfect life, buried in a borrowed tomb, three days later walked out of the grave, resurrected, alive forevermore. This is Christ. God, man, Christ. And then the last word is response. I have to respond to that. It's not enough to have intellectual knowledge of it. It's not enough to, to see that as a set of propositional statements. I must respond to that. And I respond. The New Testament way of responding is to make an about face, to turn from my, my sin. And as I turn, believe on Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Rest in Jesus. That's, those are four words that I believe helps us understand this statement of discipleship begins by acknowledging you need Jesus as Savior. And some here, under the sound of my voice, or listening on Facebook, some need Jesus. You may be living in a, in a delusional world that all is well, that you, that you are an American, or you were born in America, or you, you are a good person, or you've turned over... Um, you've had new resolutions to do better but you've never trusted in Jesus Christ to be Savior and Lord of your life you've never repented and embraced Him and you live with this delusional idea that all is well when, you, when it's not and I'm, I'm just I am doing this I'm begging, I'm pleading with you to look to who the God of the Bible is if you, you, you hate things that are associated with Christianity or you keep your distance from it and you say, well, I, I know I'm a Christian, that should give you cause for concern. If you don't love the things that are of God, should that not be red flags? Yes, certainly it should. So discipleship begins by acknowledging you need Jesus as Savior. But let me give you... The third idea here about discipleship, and that is that discipleship will include a cost. Discipleship, to follow Jesus, will include a cost. It is costly to be a Christian. Don't, don't miss that. Luke chapter 9, jot this passage down, verse 57 through 62. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, I would encourage you to do so. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 9, verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. That's Luke 9, 57, now verse 58. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. 
But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus, in verse 51, had indicated we're going to Jerusalem. They would learn more as they went along, but that meant he was going there to die. He was going to Jerusalem to go to the cross. And in that background, as Jesus is talking about his death on the cross, three individuals express an initial interest. The first one approaches him. I will follow you wherever you go. I'll follow you. I'm ready. I'm all in. And you see what Jesus said in verse 58. He's in essence saying, this is not going to be an easy journey. You're not going to have a comfortable, cushy, smooth, easy life. It's not the way it's going to roll out. Another, or to another rather, Jesus said, follow me. So the first one just came up and said, I'll follow you. But then the second person, Jesus said to him, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. It sounds kind of harsh if we're honest. Verse 60, what Jesus is saying. The reality is the man's father had likely not even died He wants delayed discipleship. He wants to to put this off. Jesus' words in verse um, 61 are not words of indifference, or verse 60. It's just really calling out the excuse this person is hiding behind. And the other that said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say farewell to those at home. Jesus is, is again laying this out, that discipleship is going to be costly, and following him, you you can't do this and look back. I think that's the obvious meaning of verse 62. You can't plow a straight furrow and look behind you. You can't do it. We might say in modern day um, understanding of this, you cannot drive forward going 60 miles an hour if you're looking in your rearview mirror. It's just not going to work. And so, discipleship will include a cost. But, my friends, don't miss this, that he is the pearl of great price worth sacrificing everything to have. There is nothing that you have, nothing that you've had, nothing that you will obtain that's greater or better than knowing Jesus. He is, knowing him is the greatest thing in all of life. Knowing him is... Nothing can compare to this, to being saved, to having your sins forgiven, to knowing that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, that he has washed you and cleansed you, and that you have a home in heaven when you die, that he will reframe and reshape your life for his good purposes. What could be better than that? And yet, let us not fail to understand that following Jesus will be costly. I used to love as a young man to hear Billy Graham preach. And Billy Graham would always say something along the lines of, you may lose friends. He would always stress that becoming a Christian is going to be costly. And it is. If you go on with Jesus, if you press into knowing him and following him, There will be a cost involved. Number four, discipleship involves investing in others. And this is where I'm just going to introduce it this morning. And this is essentially where uh, we'll jump in next Sunday morning, Lord willing. But remember what Jesus said? Follow me and I'll make you what? Can you say it? Fishers of men. That's what I'm going to do in your life. I'm going to so work in your heart and your circumstances that You are going to become one who is capturing, catching, bringing people out out of an environment of brokenness and sin 
and you're going to bring them into safety. You're going to bring them into a new life, a new environment. But you're not going to do that unless you invest in people. You don't do that sitting in a connect group and hearing a preacher on Sunday morning exclusively. You need to sit in the connect group. You need to hear the gospel preached. We need to worship together. But we don't make disciples just sitting around in holy huddles blessing and encouraging each other. We have to build friendships with non-believers. We have to be willing to cross the street and make ourselves uncomfortable. We have to be willing to invest in people. And I think we see that in the latter part of the scripture that I read starting in verse 23. He went throughout all Galilee. So we see that Jesus is teaching and he's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. But he's doing more than teaching and proclaiming. He is healing. He is healing diseases and afflictions, various diseases, people in pain. And friends, I want to tell you, there's a lot of people in your world, in my world, that's in pain. Not pain that ibuprofen or uh, some medication can alleviate. They're in the pain of a broken life, a pain of bad choices, or a pain of trying to get to God on their own merits and the frustration of trying to be good enough and never, never feeling like they, they measure up because you can't be good enough, and that brings pain. Spiritual warfare, those oppressed by demons, do you see that in verse number 24? Paralytics, those who are physically unable to do anything for themselves, but investing in others is seen, I believe, in these verses more comes with discipleship than just learning and your own growth some of us have learned so much we've taken in so much but we've not given it out we just recycle through this building every sunday and that we should we need to be refueled we need to be recharged but we're refueled to dispense good news to be fishers of men and that's what I believe we see these disciples observing and more and more Jesus is going to hand this to them they're watching him do it here but the time's going to come that he's going to watch them do it and then the time's going to come that he's going to say I'm going back to my father but you're going to do this he's entrusting to 12 men we don't see them all here. There's more to come. But to 12 men, he is entrusting this gospel message of hope. There, there's not another plan. This is the plan. And so earlier I told you that I would ask you to make a decision. And now we, we come to that decision time for some to become a Christian. Maybe that's you. Someone here or here or here or here to become a Christian in this room today. Because there are not hoops to jump through to become a Christian. There, there are not lessons that you have to learn. There are no Bible verses you have to memorize. There, there, there's no knowledge of the Bible that you must say, I'm, I'm able to pass a test on these Bible verses. There's one thing recognition that you are lost and undone without hope and without God in the world that you're shut off alienated from God that Jesus is the Savior that died in your place that God raised him from the dead and if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ believing means trusting in relying on he will save you you will be spiritually reborn so that's a decision some need to make. Others to go to a new stage of Christian growth. A new stage of, of growing in Christ, growing in grace, growing in understanding. Some have been stuck. COVID-19 for a year put the world in isolation and on hold. And, and that's, that's a discussion maybe in another setting. But... This is the problem for some. 
you have just been spiritually isolated. You spiritually own hold. Way before COVID, you've just isolated yourself. And God, I'm, I believe, is calling some to make a decision to break out of that uh, incarceration or whatever that you put yourself in and come into the freedom of growing in Christ. Some need to take a step in laying aside distractions. That's a decision some need to make. Things have distracted you. Things have just become more of a priority in your life. What you have or don't have, obsession with this or obsession with that, you've become distracted. Maybe you're distracted by yourself. You're caught up in, in who you are or what you're, you're not. And so this is a decision time for some to lay aside distractions. A decision time regarding God's call to vocational Christian service. What, what are you going to do when you're retired? What, what are you going to do when you come to that the, the last day on the job? What if God lets you live 20, 30 years? Do you want to spend all that on a golf course or a tennis court or a bicycle or a deer stand? Is that, is, that, is that what God, the glory of God, is that what he wants us to do with our life? Is there anything wrong with any of those things? No. But if those things consume you, if that's, what, if that's all you've got to live for, brothers and sisters, God's son, Jesus, bled out his blood on a cross and was raised from the dead. How can we just treat that as if, thank you, Jesus, I believed in you, I prayed my prayer of salvation, and I'm all good. Let me just live my life. No, God calls us to so much more. So I'm just going to ask that we take a moment to pray. We bow our heads, close our eyes. and This is, now it's your time. It's your decision time. This is between you and the Lord. You know what decision you need to make. But I'm just going to ask that we have a moment or two of silence and reflection and quiet before the Lord. And you pray, if you need to be saved, ask Jesus into your life to save you. Speak to me after the service if you make that decision. Maybe someone you're seated with can help you process that more. Other decisions, let's just now quietly before the Lord wait. As you continue to pray, I'm going to voice a prayer and just ask that we remain seated and in a spirit of prayer. In a moment, we're going to be singing together about following Jesus. You may not be ready to stand. You may not need to stand. You may need to just keep in your seat and, and keep praying because God's dealing with your heart about something. You may want to leave where you're seated and come down to the altar and just Kneel here and pray, and if you, if you want to do that, we, you're more than welcome and invited uh, to do that if you want to come and pray. God, I pray that you would help many in this room to hear your voice to say, I want to begin to follow you, Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. No none go with me, I still will follow. Lord, I pray that you would help us to put the world behind us and to truly say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Oh God, I pray for some today for the first time, for the first time 
to see Jesus, the Lamb of God, and say, I'm following Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to be saved. I'm praying for Christians who are stuck, who have been in spiritual isolation to begin to grow, to go to a new stage, a new phase of spiritual growth. I'm praying, Father, for those that have been distracted by the world, the flesh, the devil, that those distractions would be laid aside. And even this morning, there would be many that would say, those are, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm done with this, and I'm looking to Jesus alone. God, I pray that men and women in this room would hear your call to vocational Christian service. I pray for teenagers that are plotting out their lives that they would consider what do you want them to do, God? I pray for college students not to consider what, which major will bring me the greatest income, but how could I study in such a way that I, I could spend my life bringing glory to God? Even now, Lord, will you speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. And we're going to sing this song. You'll see it on the screen. I have decided to follow Jesus. Will you sing it out, church? Let's sing it together.